Hi, we're from the National Association of Alienated Parents. Myself, Andrew John Teague, uh, Peter Davis. This year, 2018, we launched NAP, the National Association of Alienated Parents, to introduce the, this educational DVD for schools and contact centres to have a full understanding of what goes on in the background and the forefront uh, with children throughout the UK. Hi, my name is Peter Davis. I'm uh, one of the directors of NAP and we formed back in March. One of the things that we're acutely aware of since forming is that there's a need to improve awareness throughout the general public and especially amongst professionals working with children and families. One of the main areas that we've uh, discovered is that there's a paucity of information in schools and contact centres and this is what this video is intended to address. I'm Karen Woodall, I'm from the Family Separation Clinic in London where I work with children and families who are affected by divorce and separation. I'm an internationally recognised expert in working with children who reject or refuse to have a relationship with a parent after family separation. And this is one issue which I think is not understood very well and which needs to be uh, more clearly articulated so that those who are working with children can probably recognise and understand and help. If you're working with children who are affected by divorce and separation, you will be aware that there are some who will say things about a parent which may in the end turn out to be untrue. You will be aware that divorce and separation affects children and affects how they behave. It creates great anxiety for some children. But within the overall group of children who are affected by divorce and separation, there's a small group who become very stuck in a particular type of behaviour. This behaviour is a rejection of one parent and a strong alignment to the other. The behaviours that are seen in these children are very clear and if you understand those behaviours, you are more able to help children in these circumstances. This video is for head teachers and teachers and pastoral carers who are working with children of divorce and separation. It is designed to help you to understand those behaviours which are seen in this small group of children who reject a parent. This problem is called parental alienation. You may have heard of the label before or it may be new to you. This video will help you to deepen what you do know and also introduce you to concepts which you may have not heard about but which you may well recognise as the video unfolds. One of the biggest difficulties for head teachers or teachers who are working with children of divorce and separation is when a child says that they do not want to see a parent after separation and they become very clear that they do not want one of their parents to come to any school event or to even be on the school premises. This can often place schools in a very difficult position and many schools will take the line that they want to keep school a safe place. One of the problems for children of divorce and separation is that if the school in making these decisions convey to the children that one parent is, is acceptable and the other parent is not, the school, even as it tries not to be involved, becomes entangled in the problem. Children need schools to be a place where both of their parents are welcome. The message that this gives to children when schools welcome both parents, even when children are in the defensive position of saying that they do not want to see a parent, is that the message that both parents are important to a child becomes conveyed clearly. Children should not have the right or the responsibility to make a decision to reject one parent and to align with the other. When this is seen, it is a particular maladaptation to the divorce and separation process. What it tells us is that the family as a whole are struggling to make the move from living together to living apart. What it also tells us is that there may be deeper, hidden problems in the family, such as one parent deliberately influencing a child and preventing the other parent from having anything to do with that child for reasons which are unseen. Therefore, 
When you see a child who is in a rejecting position, when you see that they are strongly and adamantly refusing and rejecting a parent, it should be a cause for concern. It should alert you to the fact that there is a deeper, hidden problem. The common view of a child who rejects a parent is that that parent must have done something to have caused that rejection in the first place. In reality, in the majority of these cases, the reasons why the child has rejected that parent turn out to be flimsy and weak. Children will say to us that they don't want to see a parent because that parent has made them eat broccoli, for example, or that that parent makes them do their homework. What the children are doing is using an infantile defense mechanism called psychological splitting to resolve the impossible position that they're in. And in doing so, they're taking energy away from the things that they should be involved in, such as learning and playing at school. And therefore, if you become alienation aware, if you become aware of the signs and symptoms that a child displays, and if you realize that there are things that you can do to help that child, then one of the things that you are doing is promoting that child's life chances over the longer term. We currently live in an environment in the UK where the voice of the child is considered to be very important. What you are listening to when you see a child reject a parent is the hidden voice of the child. The child is actually saying, I'm in a situation which is too difficult for me to cope with and therefore I'm going to reject one parent and align with the other in order to feel comfortable. At school, that child may well appear to do incredibly well at the beginning. But what we see and what research evidence tells us is that as time goes by, that child starts to show the signs of psychological splitting. Splitting is a defense mechanism which no child should be displaying beyond the age of two or three. It creates a belief in the child that there are wholly good things and wholly bad things in the world, that there is no ambivalence, there are no shades of grey. What happens as the child gets older is that they then begin to build relational patterns which uphold this splitting. This means that when they attempt to form peer group uh, relationships, when they go into older, adult, uh, more adult relationships, they start to put people on pedestals and then knock them down very quickly. They cannot hold ambivalent feelings. One of the things that we see in younger children who become psychologically split is that they suffer a great deal of generalised anxiety. Generalised anxiety disorder is a problem that young children find it very difficult to cope with. It causes sleeplessness, it causes uh, agitation, it causes a lack of focus. All of those things really create problems when children are trying to learn. Children who are psychologically split will become unduly involved in adult issues. And as they do, they lose the ability to enjoy unconscious play and learning. And it's that element which for schools becomes the most important thing to think about. A child who is involved in adult issues who is heard to say that they don't want to, a parent to be on the school premises, who becomes distressed if dad attends a sports day, or becomes overly uh, keen to make sure that mum isn't allowed on the school premises ever, is actually showing the problem of psychological splitting in a strong way. And schools can help to avoid this. One of the things that schools can do is to have a clear divorce and separation policy, which all parents can be given at the child's entry into school. A clear divorce and separation policy conveys to parents what the school will and will not do if the family separates. A divorce and separation policy should make it clear that the school will communicate directly with both parents and that the school will not uphold the child's rejection. Some teachers find this quite difficult and find that the voice of the child uh, really means following what the child says. But if we're going to really work from the perspective of the voice of the child, 
what we have to do is to uphold the child's right to a relationship with both parents. And so, in the absence of any clear evidence, and evidence should be that which is um, conveyed in the court process or that which is seen through the police process, in the absence of any clear evidence that a parent has done something wrong to a child, then that child should be made aware that their rejection will not be upheld by the school. This gives a clear message to the child that both parents are important in their lives and that they can go back to the unconscious work of learning and playing as other children do. We know from our work at the Family Separation Clinic that schools who follow this process and who are very clear with parents about what they will and will not accept on the school premises after divorce and separation are those where children of divorce and separation do very well. Um, children of divorce and separation do not have to be disadvantaged by divorce and separation and schools can play a big part in preventing disadvantage from occurring. Schools have almost as much time with a child as the parents do and in some cases more time. Therefore they play an integral part in helping a child to maintain a balanced relationship with both parents. The school does not have to be the place where the parental conflict is played out. It doesn't have to be the place where one parent attempts to convince the school that the other parent is dangerous. The school can remain outside of all of the dynamics of divorce and separation by having a clear divorce and separation policy, a clear commitment to ensuring that the flow of information about the child goes to both parents, not just one, putting the other parent at distance. What you will see in this video is information which will help you to understand the problem of parental alienation at a deeper level. What you will hear more of in this video are the ways in which parents attempt to influence schools and the ways in which parents can use schools as a ground for conflict. In understanding these dynamics, you can become more alienation aware and you can protect children from the efforts of parents to use schools in a campaign against uh, the other parent. This information is critically important. This is a hidden problem. It is one which runs throughout our society and which has been normalized and deeply hidden for many years. Many people who we work with immediately recognize the issue when we describe it. They immediately understand that someone in their school or in their family has been affected by it. By watching this video, you can more fully understand the problem and you can learn about what you can do differently that can help children of divorce and separation and protect and improve their life chances over many years to come. Well, hello, my name is Stuart Hontry. I am uh, an advisor to an organisation called the National Association of Alienating Parents who have asked me to come in and contribute to a, an educational DVD that are preparing for schools to perhaps help schools understand and to increase their awareness of a concept known of phenomenon called parental alienation. Um, now parental alienation is a, uh, a, a, a phenomenon where um, one parent will uh, manipulate their children to reject needlessly a relationship with the other parent. And when we look at parental alienation in clinical terms, it's not just a single um, mental health problem, it's a series of incremental mental health problems which are likely to develop in the absence of any effective intervention uh, for these type of children. So be, being able to um, see and be aware and see how these uh, events progress is extremely important, especially for first instance professionals who get lots of time with these children, such as teachers. Um, and from what we've seen, um, schools can be key players in parental alienation. They can be key, key players in progressing it, they can be key players in preventing it. Um, if they have the awareness, they can see it developing and do 
things that are uh, very useful in stopping the progression of uh, these mental health disorders at whatever stage they may be. Um, but what we see normally is we have um, four types of um, responses from schools. Um, they can be facilitators. There are two types of facilitators. Um, one is the um, head teacher or the teachers who decide actively to assist one parent in manipulating their children against the other parent. There are those who naively do the same thing. So they're still engaging in the, in, in the behaviours of ostracising the, the other parent, normally the non-resident parent. Um, but uh, also there are the schools who are helpless to do, they think they're helpless to do anything positive when in fact they're not. And the fourth type is those who are child focused, do everything they possibly can to help the child. And with those kind of um, schools, we see far better outcomes for those children very, very much earlier. So I'm going to try and uh, promote the awareness of this kind of phenomenon in uh, schools because we know that it's a major problem for not just for schools but for the children within those schools and it's a major disruptor of um, schools from their core duties of educating children. And these kind of children can be not only the children difficult but the interactions with the, with the professionals are difficult and the interactions with the parents and an inordinate amount of time can be um, spent by professionals within schools um, doing things that they're not really trained to do uh, and it really takes them away from their core duties of educating not just that child but other children as well. So probably the first concept that um, certainly teachers need to be aware of and head teachers is a thing called triangulation where um, uh, an older person who has some form of control over the children manipulates them into a campaign against somebody else to support them in a campaign. So the child becomes an active player uh, against somebody else. Um, so the first person to be recruited is the child into this, but also alienating parents will do everything they can to um, triangulate and recruit other forms of support, mainly from professionals. And it would be every agency that the child is likely to, who's, uh, across whose radar the child is, is likely to, to move, such as social services, sometimes the police, certainly the schools, and, you know, uh, and we'll focus on the schools here, and also um, trying to uh, manipulate and recruit both sides of the family uh, against, the, um, uh, against what we call the targeted parent, or the parent that's the controlling parent.